Um, welcome. This is the, the last session of the day. Um, and it's, again, this is a conversation. It's an unmoderated conversation between two scholars um, around the questions of democracy and counterinsurgency. Um, so sort of the, the premise of this conference is that India has experienced 70 years of democracy. Um, but of course, this is not true in many parts of the country and for many people in the country, um, you know, in the Northeast, in the Forest Belt, and elsewhere. Um, so these are areas in which years of popular struggle towards democracy have, been lim have had limited success um, and have often been met with brutal counterinsurgent state violence. Um, so this panel is sort of bringing together, I think, some of the themes that we discussed this morning, sort of Sunil's paper on state violence and then the questions that Shandipto and Anu were raising around sort of moves for inclusion, greater inclusion. Um, but it brings them together to sort of think about democracy from the perspective of counterinsurgency and state violence. Um, uh, so let me introduce the, the conversants. Um, first, we have Dr. Dolly Kikon, who teaches anthropology and development studies at the University of Melbourne. Her monographs include Life and Dignity, Women's Testimonies of Sexual Violence in Bhimapur, and Experiences of Naga Women in Armed Conflict, Narratives from a Militarized Society. Her articles have, have appeared in Economic and Political Weekly, Inter-Asia Cultural Studies, um, South Asia Journal of South Asian Studies, Anthropology News, International Institute for Asian Studies Newsletter, and Asian Currents. She's contributed chapters and edited book series published by Oxford University Press, Cambridge University Press, Rutledge, Zuban, Chicago University Press, and University of Vienna Press. In addition, her opinion piece has been carried by Open Democracy, Seminar, The Hindu Times of India, Mor Morung Express, Nagaland, pa Nagaland Page, Eastern Mirror, Himal, South Asia, Scroll, Kafila, and Riot. She's currently working on a research project on indigenous cuisines in the uplands of the Eastern Himalayas. Um, Nandini Sundar is professor of sociology at the Delhi School of Economics um, at Delhi University. Her recent publications include The Burning Forest, India's War and Buster, an edited volume, The Scheduled Tribes and Their <laughs> India, uh, and Civil Wars in South Asia, State Sovereignty Development. She was awarded the Infosys Prize for Social Sciences, um, Social Anthropology, and the Esther Bostrup Prize for Development Research in 2016. And her public writings are available at nandinisundra.blogspot.com. Something that neither of the speakers told me in the bios they sent me, though, um, was that they both actually have a lot of experience working in sort of legal advocacy. Um, Dr. Kikon is trained as a lawyer right, and has worked as a legal advocate in these areas uh, in the Northeast around questions of land and resource ownership. And Professor Sundar um, has been involved in political legal advocacy work. Um, she was one of the, on the rules committee for the Forest Rights Act um, and brought forward the PIL around um, the Sabah Judum in Chhattisgarh. Um, so something, I don't know, the, the conversation is going to go in many directions, but um, uh, I hope this is something they might have the chance to discuss. The fact that they've both been involved in legal work to sort of hold state violence to account through laws passed by the state. Um, and with that, I'll leave to them. It's going to be a 45 minute discussion, and then there's a 40 minute, five minute discussion between them, and then 45 minutes QA. Thanks. So, can I have a question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so, I really like um, I mean, the way in which your work brings in a very new perspective um, on the whole, both not just a counterinsurgency, but on the way that the Northeast is traditionally conceptualized both uh, in popular discourse as well as in academic writing. So what are the ways that you would change the writing um, and the kind of academic uh, field of Northeast studies, including dissolving the area itself as a particular unit? I think that we need to speak more directly into the minds mm -hmm. of the okay. Oh, OK. So shall, shall I? Uh, um, uh, first of all, thank you so much for this time, Alf. Um, I'm so happy to be here in Oslo. It's my first time, and I think I've read a lot of scholars who are here from my grad school, including your work. And me too. I'm also studying. very happy yeah. to be here. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I and so yeah. <laughs> so in terms of because this really this question is about writing and about Northeast India. Um, I remember I studied in Delhi. So I went to university in Delhi, and it was in the 90s. And there were very, very um, few things available to read about 
Northeast India in terms of text. Uh, the only things that were coming out were really military records about counterinsurgency. And I think this takes on what Siddharth was saying about the absence of a very particular kind of writing. And being, being very young, I was very uh, struck by memoirs of army generals, uh, of governors who would then become writers. So every Indian bureaucrat or um, a military official who would come to the Northeast would eventually become a writer. So coming to that frontier and in being involved in violence was also a way of becoming um, a writer about, uh, you know, talking about a very, very dark space, this region. And then it led to another kind of writing, I think, where you found a lot of writing on which were um, academic writings, but just focused on something called case study, right? And I think if we look at the term case study, it's, I think it has a very sociological origin, but case studies were actually first I brought out as prison records. You do case studies either for mental asylums or for, or for the prison, and that's how you maintain notebooks. And so these are all case studies about villages, case studies about tribes, case studies about dances. And, and, and there were not much writing. I think one thing that I've really found in terms of writing, and in my own writing that I want to change, um, talking about the region, is really not talk about the conflict. Right? And it's, it, it, that's something I struggle with, because when you talk about the human rights movement, I was just thinking about it. I have been involved for the last 23 years. That means you know, as soon as I became an adult, the, the idea and the notion of politics was so deeply ingrained. I remember going for the Mokokchong bomb bombing um, in Delhi, in Parliament Street, which was around 1994, 95. I think we were very young at the time. Um, and so that is very, I think, very, very connected at this point in my life, how do I write about a region that I so deeply care about, but write about it by not actually addressing this usual thing called uh, violence? And that's what's taken me to write about something as crazy as food, right? I, because food is, yeah. So. No, but even when uh, you write about, um, well, we'll come to the food bit later, but uh, when you write about love, uh, in a way you still are writing about the conflict. You're writing about it in very different ways. So. I like it that, that you say it. So it's the, it's the reader who is reading into that, right? And that's what I wanted, actually, in my own writing, that I want the reader and I want the audience to decide and to actually take the stories and the accounts for what it is. And if you see that coming true, I think in some way that I have succeeded, that I want to use poetry as much as I want to use theory, I want to use Derrida to figure this out. I want to use Marx, all the... As, as a trained anthropologist, all the people that have really influenced me in some way has been people who have worked around, uh, around values or melancholia or, or, or really this, this, this process of looking at the very deep politics of transformation. And, and so in, in my writing, if that is coming true, I think, um, I think I'm succeeding in, in some way. And of course, the, the violent part of it is, is so central, but I think trying to do something or just, I'm trying to do something and that is actually push the boundaries of what, what it is to write in a conflict situation. And I think that's where my chapter on love, for example, that I send it to you, uh, talks about, about intimacy, about love. And so when today, and this is not a conversation I feel that we are having. I think when Ajay Skari was talking about intimacy and violence, I very much related to that. But, uh, you know, in your work on sexual, I mean, on violence and uh, the family and... Yeah. Um, perhaps, you know, if you tell people a bit about the kinds of case studies and the different kinds of violence that you um, study in the different, you know, with Alice and with Beth and so on, mm -hmm. and also how um, hard it might be politically to write about these other kinds of non-state family insurgent violence when the overarching context is insurgency and counterinsurgency, uh, both because of what mm. you know, human rights activists, uh, Naga groups, etc., might say about your picking up these issues, as well as how uh, the violence from one arena feeds into other arenas. Um, I love this question, and it takes me to Delhi because all the troublemakers sit in Delhi, and and I have a lot of amazing women friends and mentors who are in Delhi. And over the years, I have had conversations with them. They are the ones who took me to the first dharna, right, in Delhi. 
Um, and, and so when it comes to my writings on, on impunity, on sexual violence in the Northeast, it has to do with long conversations I've had with the women's movement based in Delhi, I think, uh, and, 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 and friends from all over the country. For some reason, whether we like it or not, people do get attracted to come to Delhi and have these conversations. And that's where I have drawn a lot of my inspiration from. Um, I was really struck before I wrote about sexual violence in Naga society, actually the monograph that I wrote recently, Life and Dignity, I attended this national gathering in Delhi and it was under this lovely theme called Ham Gunegar Orote. And women from Pakistan came, activists from Pakistan came and we had this three day of just conversation, sitting and con talking about what it means to be women in South Asia at the time. Friends from Sri Lanka came from Bangladesh, Nepal, and we all sat down, so this is really, I would say a collective voice that comes out and maybe I'm only a very small agent. Right? And I say this because, and this is also in many ways a contradiction because in the academy we are trained to own things, right? It's mine. Like this is something I formed, this is a concept that I have. But, but in a way I think with this long engagement that I've had with social and political movements around, across South Asia, it becomes really difficult to say that certain ideas or certain political projects are individual projects. It never is, and we know. I think any time we say it, we know that we are faking it big time. Um, and so this impunity project and to do with sexual violence, it was really conversations from, from the meeting Ham Gonegar Orote that happened in Delhi in 2014. I went back with the courage to actually look at that. And when I was writing about that, a lot of people said, how can you go into your own community? Naga community and you know call out people about sexual violence because you have to retain that cultural um, uh, the, the cultural sanctity because it's always against the Indian Army and and the non-state actors who are the victims and and I think it's the first monograph uh, which talks about sexual violence from really deep within the community and the struggles and the conflicts that's there and I'm so glad it's just 83 pages. It's just 83 pages, but I'm so glad that women students, male students have taken that up. They're writing master's thesis, right, for the first time. New field work, new ways of thinking about it. There's a girl in Meghalaya who's fighting against the Dorbar on how they have treated uh, cases of sexual violence. There are girls from very small towns in Assam who have picked that up. There are women's organizations who have taken this 83 page really, really small monograph as part of campaign and workshops to teach each other how to write. When I was doing field work on this monograph, Nandini, I went inside an insurgent camp, um, and this was around Dimapur. And, and let me tell you about Dimapur. Dimapur must be the only city in entire South Asia with a population of 400,000 where there are two ceasefire camps, right? It is as militarized as militarized can be. And so when I went into one of the ceasefire camps, I spoke to women and we basically sat down and we talked about sexual violence, about impunity, and about what they thought about it. And I think I give around two pages of their, uh, their reflections on that. And there was a very interesting conversation about capital punishment, right? And I feel that the, there's a lot of need to be able to reach out and, and discuss this, I think both between state and non-state actors, and I think I'm a really, really small agent in trying to figure this out within, within the academy, yeah, and also trying to, trying to have a larger engagement with that. I think it's a fantastic essay on sexual violence. So she has this chapter on um, a man who's an insurgent cadre who comes home and rapes his daughter and, uh, you know, how the family deals with that. And then you have this other S chapter on a non-Naga um, woman who's a working class woman who has to deal with her abusive husband. And through that, the kind of space that you make for non-Nagas within Nagaland and how they're imagined within the space of the Naga nationalist movement, mm -hmm. um, as well as your other work on um, foothills and intermarriages. So <laughs> in a sense, um, given that you're operating in a space where people are demanding a separate homeland, to be writing about um, intermarriages, to be writing about the common problems that non-Naga women and Naga women face in terms of sexual violence. What does that do for you in terms of offering an alternative politics? I mean, clearly you are offering through your writing an 
alternative politics to the current Naga uh, demand? Mm -hmm. And how would you articulate that? I, I think at the base of looking at intermarriages, inter-ethnic marriages, which are really frowned upon, and we talk about inter intercaste, inter-religion marriages in wider sense of the Indian uh, you know, uh, context, but again, coming to the Northeast where there's so many ethnic homeland movements, I think what, what I'm trying to interrogate and hitting back at is really the concept of purity, right? And how that is woven into nationalist uh, struggles and how we need to go back and we need to reclaim a space of politics where justice, uh, equality, and really this notion of shared future is what we're looking at. And it's quite a difficult project because these are movements that have started since India's independence and yet to go back at this time would one mean looking at uh, what is termed as impure children from inter-ethnic marriages, not knowing where to claim, are they Naga or are they Nepali, you know, are they Bihari or are they Assamese, and what kind of language of politics do they embrace? It becomes really, really important. What do we do about, let's say, uh, Marwari uh, second, third generation scholars from Guwahati? Right? What do we do about a Nepali who has grown up in Nagaland and claim a sense of Naganes? So the, 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 the notion of Naganes then the tragedy is that we didn't really this ethnic homeland struggles, what we have been reduced to in terms of understanding politics is really land and territory that is shaped not on geography but on the body. And I think that in itself is a tragedy. What we can do in a way of reshaping and reconceptualizing notions of justice would be to, I think, go back to this very, very difficult terrain once again. And I think that it's not too late. And one of the lenses that we can adopt is really a very uh, honest feminist lens because at the notion of intermarriages and purity is really the politics of procreation that's there. I think we have seen it from the Rwanda genocide. We have seen it from the India-Pakistan uh, partition narratives that's there. And it happens all the time, whether it, any time there's an ethnic cleansing that happens, the first targets, once again, as though it's a really bad tragedy, are women and children, women and children time and again, time and again. Um, and so this is where I'm hitting back at. And I think in my own case, I'm married to an SMS, right? And so any positions that I take becomes a really personal one. And I think it's not only me in the academy. I think a lot of friends that I speak to, eventually later in our lives, we go back to projects and we go back to issues that deeply haunt us and that are deeply passionate. And I think it's okay to say it. It, it's okay to say that the personal is extremely political and the things that we pick up are what makes us, not as complete beings, maybe incomplete beings, but trying to engage with a larger collective. Do you think, I mean, because when you write about the intermarriages in the foothills, one, um, you talk about the foothills as a space of mixture, uh, perhaps more than the hills which are pure. I mean, that's something that's interesting in terms of the imagining of a geographical landscape mm -hmm. as a social landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was also wondering um, whether there was actually a subterranean um, kind of movement of counter exchange, cultural uh, exchange that these, the political movements um, ignore or are going to persist beyond the political movements and whether that's something that gives positions like your strength, or is it something that is quite insignificant, really, in the larger scheme of politics? Uh, I think two things there. The first thing about where, how, in my writing, the hills become a significant place, and that has to take us to reconceptualizing what is the hill state in these frontiers, and the state project of making an ethnic hill state extremely important. And that's what I call the, the making of the developmental state, really, in the eastern Himalayas, right? A lot of development projects. If you look at the states of Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Sikkim, Sikkim today is known as the organic state in India. So these are no longer about people, it's about ecology, it's about really a market. This is where Baba Ramdev is going to come and do his entire Ayur Ayurvedic farming. As we talk, Baba Ramdev has been given 500 acres of land in Boroland. And I don't know how the Chief Minister of Assam could do that. And so this is really the hills being totally reframed into a marketable area. Um, the, the second thing about uh, it, can we get into an alternative way of thinking about politics? Um, it, it would really, I. I would say yes, I would say yes, and 
And it has to start with, I think, your book. I'm going to come back to your book. This amazing line where you're talking, uh, it's, it's, I think, 200-something page. But you're talking uh, Vani, Vani Kaka. You refer to Vani Kaka, and she tells you in this line that, you know, when you, do, when you talk about Bastar, Bastar is really a liberated zone. It's a liberated zone that is outside the Constitution of India. And I just stopped reading there, and I laughed. And it was a joyful laughter. Right? Because if we have to think about, the Constitution is really important, but there are a lot of things that can also be amended towards making it better. So when we think about an alternative way of looking at politics, I think going back to history or, or looking at the future can't be looked at in a linear line. I think in some way we have to really readjust and reframe this notion of temporality this linearity or chronology that you know the past was there, the present is here, and the future is going to be something better. And I think all of us in this room who write in some sense inhabit that moment when we are thinking about the past and yet writing for a future that we see. And it's a very weird space to be there, it's almost kind of sleepwalking. Um, and that is possible. And I'll, t I'll tell you why. In, in this area, in the foothills where I work, um, histories are told in very strange ways. And I'll tell you this small story. And I come from a storytelling culture, so I'll tell you this small story. Um, one night, really in the middle of counterinsurgency time, really bad in the 90s, you know, some friends are traveling. Uh, have you all been to Dibrugar? I know that's, that's a loser question, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so from Dibrugar, you can imagine, from Dibrugar all the way to Gohati, it's a long straight road with many trees. It's at night, they're crossing this, this hub of intellectual ULFA area called Sib Hibohagar. And as they're crossing there, it's quiet, a lot of army checks, no electricity, basically. And the driver, who's bitey, he's saying that, Dada, look out. And it's all darkness, actually, when you look out. He says, you know, bad times. These are bad times. Did you know that there was this woman whose husband was caught and um, whose husband was was being searched uh, to be caught, and she, but, but he says she was the one who got caught, and, the, and she was tied to a tree, and she was whipped, and, and then she died. And so this human rights activist, activist who's sitting inside the car says, that's really, really bad news. And he says, yeah, man, it's so bad. She was so brutally tortured, and she died. And the human rights activist then asks him, when did this happen? He looks at him, he says, oh, around 400 years ago. Actually, actually what she, he was narrating was the story of Joy Moti, right? Mm -hmm. Godador Joy Moti. So if you look at these landscapes, really, it's, it's really a pre-colonial lore, right? About this king who escapes to the hills and this wife who gives her life for, for the husband, very much so. But in some way, in a lot of these politically charged societies, Nandini, the, 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 coming back to the question, the, the past, the present, and the future in a lot of ways are mixed. Right. So I guess until and unless we are able to see this both politically and methodologically and say, no, everything changed in 1947, then I think we are, we are, it's such a tragedy. right? We look at this huge subcontinent and we try to squeeze everything within a post-47 narrative and say anything that happened before doesn't matter. And I think that's maybe not the way to go. That's what I believe in. Okay, yeah. This is really interesting, and we'll come back to this later about uh, you know, expanding uh, Indian history and uh, I mean, whatever. But I want to come to the question you were talking about earlier of being sort of part of a feminist movement and being your own personal concerns as someone who's intermarried um, into a different community. Mm -hmm. And what, could you tell us a bit about uh, the reaction of around the Naga Reservation for Women Panchayat Bill? Um, and your own role as a feminist in that and you know the reaction. So what space is there politically for feminists to organize right now in Nagaland for an alternative future? Um, that, 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 that's a very good question. I think spaces are not there. It has to be fought and it has to be claimed. Uh, and Naga society, like any, any other society, is, is, is going through a transformation. And I, I would yet put it within the larger context of militarization. It's an extremely militarized society. Uh, and yet, women have really been the, in the forefront 
of looking after families, of, of you know, men going away to war. And I'm talking about since the 1930s, 40s, right? Because hang on, the, the, the men, Naga men going away to war is not a post-47 story. It's a first world war story. It starts there. The first world war, the second world war, and on and on it goes. So it's a really long history. Um, but in terms of Naga society, the kitchen is really important for us. The kitchen, the, 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 what is known in, in Western uh, theory as the public-private sphere, and, and this really, really deep divide, really uh, might not exist. And I don't only claim you know, for Naga society, for a lot of communities outside, whether it's in Assam, whether in Delhi, every time I go to my friend's house anywhere in the world, we sit in the kitchen and there is where we plot and plan the most amazing conferences and, and, and the articles. So one of the ways in which uh, the Naga collective feminists have come together is really to claim the private sphere as a side of politics, as a side of uh, a very, very important uh, uh, political project. And I say this because after 1997, the Indo-Naga ceasefire, some of the most political uh, important conversations have come from this private sphere, from the kitchen, whether it's to do with uh, impunity, whether it's to do with single parenthood, whether it has to do with uh, stories about sexual violence, uh, whether it has to do with conversations about uh, the truth and uh, reconciliation movements that's gone across Naga society and also into the neighborhood. Uh, and I think it ties very well with my ongoing work on food, right, in terms of, I mean, what, what, is, the, what is the relation with that? And I think my, my interest in food, in consumption, as a political project emerged from the foothills. Because they, there are a lot of Hindu families, Muslim families, and also Christian families, and yet they have a very, very particular foothill sensibility where they eat together. And I think that's where I found the concept of pathos as a very important way of looking at governance. And I think the concept of pathos is something I deeply uh, engage with, especially in terms of food, in terms of governance, because when I was doing my field work <coughs> in the foothills of Assam, a lot of plantations uh, workers, especially from the Adivasi community, were going through starvation. So at the same time, they're pl plucking this fine tea that we drink, but at the same time, they're literally going through starvation and dying. So what do we, how do we then understand and conceptualize food governance within this entire larger post-colonial structure? So was, these were really ramblings that were going in my head. And ever since that time, I've written a couple of pieces. Um, and so right now, in my own work, it's become a very important lens to look at pathos governance food. And that's, that's in my way, I guess, looking at Himalayas. And my new fieldwork site is Bhutan. So I was just in Bhutan a few months ago. <laughs> but you know, isn't this, in a way, a kind of common feminist sideways move to say that there is you know, we are carving an alternative space of politics. And mm. so therefore, you know, we really don't need to um, I mean, so then, but there has been that whole movement recently where people have tried to reclaim the public sphere as well, not just say that there is this alternative, not alternative, but that there is the private sphere of, in which new kinds of politics are being produced. So given that it met with so much resistance, the idea of having reservation for women in the panchayats and, uh, I mean, in local bodies and so on. Um, Surely, surely. Uh, oh, okay. I didn't talk about the public sphere. So I spoke about reclaiming, rec re reclaiming the private sphere, not as private sphere, but as a political sphere, right? So, so in terms of the public sphere, yeah, I think women have been very visible. But, but in terms of, I think this is where we need to interrogate the, the, uh, in interrogate this very, very uh, uh, project about visibility, visibility and participation as two very different things. Right. So when it comes to visibility, you, see, you, you look at any ethnic gathering. I think that the Republic Day Parade in Delhi is a good example as well about visibility, right? that every truck is there, you know, every state is there, very visible. Um, so here I make this very specific point that they have been very visible as very beautiful women with their necklaces, you know, serving tea, uh, ethnic, ethnic clothing, very pretty. And I think it's really very thin line between what the Indian Armed Forces have, 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 have claimed the space of like extra promiscuous, extra exotic, sexualized ethnic uh, female bodies, right? And not very different from what, what this Naga uh, Naga, uh, 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 how can I say, uh, uh, councils, the traditional bodies have also done to ethnic women, 
making them very, very pretty and placing them out there, but in terms of participation and having the voice, no. So, so clearly you're right. I think their visibility, one step, but Nandini, you're very right in terms of claiming that public sphere, and it became very dirty during the 33% reservation. Maybe we could just talk a bit about it. Yeah, the so what we did during the 33% reservation was that we, went, we wore aprons. Well, three, three women, we wore aprons, uh, and uh, we were very clear that it, the apron is a sign of a very modern um, domestic <laughs> uh, what clothing, piece of clothing. We wore aprons and we held a sign and we said, serving men, uh, serving Naga men since time immemorial. <laughs> it's time for gender justice. And we, we had a signature campaign and it blew out. It just went berserk crazy. So there were council, councils and there were traditional bodies who said that they would sue us, right? They, they, they would like uh, uh, punish us. And so our entire personal beast were actually brought out in the paper and not that we cared in any way. Uh, but this, is, this was a really a process of introspection as well. And it started thousands of Twitter sites, thousands of Facebook accounts. We got guns as attached files in our mails. I, I mean, anyway. Uh, and. I, I went ahead and I wrote this piece called uh, Reflections of a Naga Feminist. I think that came out in scroll. Like Kafila carried it. Some other online groups also carried it. And I think that that's where, I think the 33% reservation was good. The debate was good. It really, really broke the lines. It really made the politics very clear that we are out there and we're going to talk about it. Uh, and so men came out, women came out. There were... Um, public forums discussing about what is feminism. And I think talking about tribal feminism is very important. And like we were saying, as far as, I think in terms of uh, uh, literature in Africa, in terms of customary laws involved, there are some interesting work there. But when it comes to India, when it comes to the customary, when it comes to the tribal, I think there's something quite homogeneous and quite romantic about it. And we need to go back to the traditional councils to see what kind of gender equality, what kind of principles do we follow. Right, because these are really sites where there's a lot of uh, reification of power, it's patriarchal power, electoral power, like the, like the ones you've been writing about it. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's a kind of very complicated debate because there's also lots which is horrible about the formal legal system which the traditional councils actually address in a better fashion. Um, so in a sense, it would be something that would have to be fought both at the formal legal level as well as locally. Um. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think in terms of the traditional councillors, as, as long as they, they open it up to women, as long as they say that it's okay for women to participate, it's okay for women to become members, it's okay for women to have, to have uh, inheritance rights, it's okay for women to have child custodial rights, it's okay for women to be single, to be single mothers, uh, it's okay for women to bring cases of rape and sexual violence to traditional courts. Right? So, so, so as far as they open it up to, to really this framework of gender justice and participation, they should be there, but as it is now, it's deeply, deeply problematic. What do you, um, tell us a bit about your writing and what, who you write for, how that changes the way you write, especially because you're raising all these controversial issues which uh, will be read both by people in Nagaland and academics elsewhere who are not politically and personally invested in it in the same mm -hmm. way. So how do you straddle these different um, Worlds of writing. You know, I, I struggle with writing. I don't come from I don't come from a family who writes at all, um, and and ac academia is very new for me. I had a whole life before I came to the academy. So if you look at me, I'm really not a career academic who finished PhD at 22, right? Uh, I, I had a, I had a law background. I became a full-time activist. I went to grad school you know, very late. I was sitting with kids in the class, right, who were so articulate. And one of the things that I realized was that, oh my God, being articulate means that there is also a dark side to it. Because what the academy teaches us, and I was trained in North America, I'll be very specific, what the academy does teach us is to be addicted to our own voice. Yeah. Right, that we sound so smart. And I call it the, I call it the, I call it the curse of articulation. Right. And as much as we tell, and, and because, I, because, I, because I straddle, and I've seen a lot of my friends are very good lawyers, I see the world of 
of law and I see the world of academia as well. And I say, oh my God, what's happened to us? The most intelligent and the most articulate people are here and we have, what we have done is we have literally stopped listening. Right? So as much as, as academics, we tell lawyers we are worse off. Right? Um, if, we have been able, if we are able to give a three hour seminar nonstop, I think that means we're really addicted to talking, right? We need to go through this period of de-addiction as well. And, and there has to be some kind of honesty in this reflection anyway. So there was something on the side, footnote, okay. Um, so in terms of learning, in terms of writing, learning how to write was such a difficult process for me. For the longest time, people told me I couldn't write. And it was really a struggle. And it's very different than to come from a family, you, to sit at a table every evening and talk about very intellectual stuff, right? It's very dif dif different to really come from a family with no writing and a very, very different uh, social and uh, economic background, and then to learn how to write. And I guess I really value the struggles that I still, when I look at a blank paper, I have no idea what's going to come out. And it's been friends who have been very generous and kind and who have told me that, you know, it's okay, we struggle. We come from very good families. Our grandfathers were doctors and, you know, my, my, my father is a scientist and I went to a, public, a private school, but even I struggled to write. I think that kind of honesty gave me the courage to think that people do struggle with writing in the academy. And I feel that this is something um, that I really honestly, I feel, in my own vulnerability, engage with the struggles of writing. And, and, and with that, I tie a process where I need to be accountable for things that I write. And this process of accountability is, of course, to an audience, which are my very dear students. I call myself a teacher today, and I think it's really a blessing to be a teacher um, to my students, but at the same time, and a sense of accountability to myself, right, to the friends that I have outside who are activists, uh, who are teachers, who are journalists. And I think if there's one thing that I can call myself uh, as a well, very wealthy person, not in terms of money, but in terms of friendships, in terms of solidarities, the, the kinds of friends and the kinds of worlds that I have seen in, in, in the Indian subcontinent around South Asia and around the world, I think is something which really encourages me to hone this skill of writing. And I think there's many people in the room who are sitting that I've read a lot of their writings, including your writing, and it really inspires me to, to hope that I can write better. Yeah, I'm not yet there. Who is, I mean, nobody would, I think, <laughs> think that there in terms of writing. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so I, I really want to, yeah, I've been talking a lot, but I really want to ask you a lot of questions. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I carried this book. I carried this book from Delhi to, to Melbourne because Elf, I think Elf and we have been writing very early on and I gave my dates for this meeting when I knew that Nandini would be coming. Um, and I bought this book in Delhi. When I bought this book in Delhi, I'll not tell which journalist. I, I was really tired and I said, hey, have you read Nandini Sundar's new book, The Burning Forest? And looked at me, he said, yeah, I've read. I said, what did you think about it? And he said, it's very unfortunate. He said, he said, it's very unfortunate that an academic had to write it. It was a job of a journalist to do it. She went out. She went out, you know, of her comfort zone, which might be really an academic, of, you know, the responsibilities that she had as a teacher. And after all the cases that she fought at the Supreme Court, that she took it upon herself to write this. And it's in that context that I say that it's so unfortunate that it's, it's Nandini who had to sit down and do this. We, we should have done it. So in a way, I think he was really very deeply appreciative that this book was written as a witness, that this book was written for us to read and to understand what was happening in modern India. And, it, and that thought really rang. And I thought that when I was talking about the book, that I had to really say what this journalist friend of mine had to say about that. But can I just say, I don't like journalists thinking they're the only ones who can go out there in the field, you know? It's like, especially us anthropologists who think that we are the ones who are in the field and the journalists are superficial. Yeah. And it's really and, kind but, of... But, but, he came, but, he, but he came from a really, I think he came from a really good place. I was like, what? Yeah, yeah, really? I'm not yeah. Like, um, I, I read... I think I read I read two pieces. So I read your book and I read this this article that you sent, Hostages to Democracy. And when I read this, Nandini Sundar's uh, second piece, Hostages to Democracy, is really about 
counterinsurgency on a lot of points that she writes about. The debate over Indian democracy, violence and democracy, the dangers of democracy in India, welfare as an instrument of counterinsurgency, elections as instruments of counterinsurgency, and finally, accountability and democracy. And I wish you could read that. It's, it's really, really an important point. Um, and this is something that you write about, Chhattisgarh, and you write about India you know, in general, but this is something that we have really seen in Northeast India as well. And I say that because in my, in my own family, I think we are, like I was sharing with you, we are stuck, with, we are stuck forever with, with this thing called Indian election because the name of my middle sister is Tangjano in Lota, and Tangjano means the victorious one. And the, the fault lies with my father. So my father believed in this thing called Indian election, Nandini, that you write about. And, and he ended up, from, from the village, he ended up contesting four elections, which totally ruined the family. And, and I'm so glad that you wrote this piece in terms of looking at Indian elections. Um, and counterinsurgency and how you bring it up so well together. And I think this is, this is so important because one of the things that I think, one of, one of the persons who came to my mind when I was reading this was James Ferguson's The Anti-Politic Machine and really the apparatus of you know, development and bureaucracy. And I think you're really pushing, pushing in terms of politics and, and, violent, and violent democracies, as I would say. So can you tell us something about this? I'm, I don't know whether the audience have read about it, but I think this is, this, is, this is really, really an important contribution. Hostages to democracy, how did you come with that concept? Well, actually, uh, this film, Newton, I was telling you about, which has just been India's, uh, it's been nominated as India's official uh, entry for the Oscars, is about elections on one day, and it's really worth watching if you haven't seen it. Um, but this title is actually because, you know, I was actually at a book release two days before coming um, where it, this was a book about uh, those Italian journalists who were kidnapped in Bastar in, uh, in uh, Odisha in 2012. And, you know, the book was about the family of the, journal, uh, the guys who were kidnapped. And I'm very sad that Italian journalists were kidnapped. I mean, Italians were kidnapped, or anybody is kidnapped. I'm not, I don't support kidnaps as such, or at all. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, you said, <laughs> thanks for saying that. <laughs> no, but the fact is that every day, like, not every day, but so many people are just being kidnapped by the police forces and shown as surrendered. And mm. uh, so they really are hostages to this idea that, uh, you know, they are surrendered people. And this friend of mine, Podiam Panda, who I thank in my acknowledgments, and at that time he was underground, but in April this year he was picked up from his village and shown as surrendered and tortured. And he was, so his wife filed a habeas uh, corpus for him and he was brought to court and surrounded by police and obviously he could say nothing else but that he had surrendered. And he's now in police custody. And unlike an arrest where you can actually, um, you know, there's a legal process that you can follow to then get the person out. If somebody has surrendered, there is no legal process at all because they are voluntarily there living with the police. And now who would want to leave their family and just go off and live with their next best friend, the police? Uh, but that's the way that, according to the police, hundreds of people in this country uh, have suddenly developed great love for the police. So this idea that you know democracy at large is something that we can't I mean, it sounds good like surrenders, it's better than being encountered or arrested, but at the same time, it's such, it's even more of a problem because we don't know how to um, officially find a way of saying that what we have now is not democracy. You know, it's much harder when you have something that's positive sounding to reject um, and to find problems with. Although we all know that there are all sorts of problems with democracy, the kind of money that's spent. Uh, and one of the things that Siddharth uh, sort of didn't mention is that, although it was sort of implicitly there, was that which he himself had written about was that Modi's spend in 2014 was just on advertising was more than, you know, Trump spent in the whole election. Um, so, or, uh, so it was just, um, you know, so we know all of these issues, but on the other hand, to, for anyone to say they're against democracy is somehow, 
I mean, so then what are you for if not this? So it's, I mean, that's why really this essay was written to sort of think through mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. some of those problems. And, and if I may still linger on this wonderful article, uh, one of the key issues that you're tackling with and you, you focus on is actually the Adivasi scheduled tribe um, uh, issue about poverty disposition and their experiences of counterinsurgency. And you allude to it, and it doesn't really come out in the paper, but I'd really like to hear this from you. I think it comes out in the book very well. It has to do with resource wars, right? the, the future of mining, the mining leases which are given to actually uh, people who are funding elections. And so the nexus is quite clear. It's very clear. Um, so so what is, how, would you, how would you see this, the, the future of land and the future of resources in the areas where you work around Chhattisgarh? Is it really bleak or is there any kind of uh, politics that will come up in terms of the collective? So I think in the way that you um, talk about all the things that the official focus on counterinsurgency conceals, which is violence within the family, mm -hmm. violence, one of the things that this whole discourse of resource theft um, and insurgency conceals is the kind of everyday fashion in which people's livelihoods are being taken away. So there's huge migration from all of these areas, which um, you know makes it both harder for one to imagine any kind of alternative legal. So, so if you look at the sort of official um, provisions within the constitution for Adivasi rights, there are things like PESA or Forest Rights Act, which are all predicated on the notion of a community being there to manage. But yes. if the community is not there, everybody's gone to Bombay or Delhi or somewhere else to work, then there's very little management happening, as well as, you know, even for the Maoists, there's nobody left to recruit because everybody's pushed off. So that, I think, is one huge issue that is, um, in a way, not being talked about, the trafficking, the migration uh, from all these areas, because the emphasis is so much on these large-scale dispossessions, which are there. I mean, I'm not saying that they're not there, mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. are, uh, they're visible in some places, people are resisting. But um, what I worry more about is the sort of insidious dispossession. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I think one, you know, c coming back to you. Which is also happening in, uh, I mean, both into Nagaland people are coming as well as people leaving a lot, right? From oh, Manipur, especially huge. Huge, huge, yeah. And mm -hmm. I think my last project was, was looking at that in terms of in, uh, internal uh, indigenous, uh, you know, tribal migration all over, all over India. And what does it say about this image of new liberal India, you know, and th this global image where a lot of people who, you know, who look like they're from the Himalayas are, as, are there as global servers of a very particular kind of consumption. Um, but I. I think coming coming back to your to your book, I have some questions and and you know since we are talking about resources, um, I have a couple of questions about um, the book that you write so beautifully and I just very very much want to read the epilogue if it's okay with the audience. May I, may I read some parts of that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is, this is how Nandini ends uh, her book. It's called A New Compact. In the novel Atonement, the protagonist cannot endure the unbearable sadness of what actually happened, so she decides to write an alternative happy ending. Like her in my other story, I see the forested hills of Buster around me with no sign of a paramilitary camp. The jungle has grown over to cover the scars. Following a change of government, there was an accord and all those responsible for mass crimes were put in jail. A new constitution gave all people the right to decide how they wanted their resources to be used. Eminent domain under which the government claimed ownership of all land was banished forever. All the royalties from the existing Baidala, Baila Dila mines and the profits from the steel plants in Nagarnar went to an elected council managed, among others, by village elders and former Adivasi guerrillas. They used it to level the fields and build ponds, schools, hospitals, etc. Everything else, the villagers decided, would be left as forest. The people set up small cottage industries to add value to the minor forest produce they were collecting. 
In any case, they got a fair price for all their labor, and the traders no longer made huge profits by cheating them. New methods made agriculture sustainable and also ensured the villagers got healthy organic grain to eat. Primary health centers started working in every panchayat, and children were no longer pot bellied and hung with hunger. No one was landless, no one migrated for labor. In my narrative, I walk through dense and fragrant forest, and I can hear the coil calling. School teach in Gondi, Norwa, Hindi, and English with options to learn Spanish, Arabic, or Chinese. They have well-equipped well chemistry labs and large playing fields. School projects include making and editing Gondi films, recording traditional songs, and cataloging the plants that grow in their forest. Immigrant children also learn the local languages in school and take pride in Adivasi culture instead of looking down on it. Once they grow up, some of them, like Hibni and Hadma, Masa and Deva become novelists, lawyers, politicians, and scientists using their knowledge of the forest to create life-saving drugs. But they, are, but they always come home for the village Mandai to worship the, their hill gods. My story dances with abandon to the sound of the Madhya Dhol under a full moon night where my friends and I raise a toss to Mahua to hope and the future. So it's... I would say that in this in this in this book, it's really a politics of future and a politics of hope. You you talk about, and if I may just ask you the the final question, I think writing is very central in a way for you as a political being. And I take this from the preface of your book, where you write four very lovely uh, paragraphs where you talk about writing. And the last one is very profound, where you say that you write the book for yourself which I find that not many people would say when they write a book, and you call yourself as a helpless witness to what's happening. So can you tell us something about your writing, Nandini? <laughs> That's my last question. Mm -hmm. Well, it has to be for myself because it's not making much difference to anybody else, and certainly not making <laughs> any not difference true. <laughs> to the government of India. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I really, I mean, really then it has to be because it's cathartic and it's um, and anyways now that it's done it's out there and um, I you know there's not much hope till the Modi government goes mm -hmm. so then we shall see what happens next um, I mean what else to say because <laughs> there's really nothing um, I mean I don't see that any process of rule of law is working. I don't see that there is anything, um, you know, the kind of legally, um, one can sort of putter away at little, little um, legal interventions, but there has to be an overall political climate for talks. Mm -hmm. And I think that in a way comes back to the role that there needs to be all over the country for people to frame alternative imaginations of peace. And mm -hmm. for that, we really need to have these, you know, as you said, feminist cross-casting solidarities, other kinds of solidarities that we don't have a peace movement in the country at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's always been ambivalence about violence because it's been either revolutionary violence or it's been nationalist violence or there's been other kinds of violence and there's never been the same kind of constituency for just having peace as the starting point, and then working out democratic alternatives on the basis of peace. Mm -hmm. And I think that possibly with, there has to be some kind of long-term movement for that. Mm -hmm. um, so. But thank you for writing this book. Thank yeah. you for reading yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We now have some time for questions. Take them. Um, well, my question is to Dolly, but I just want to say that you know that entire conversation. It was uh, really, really insightful, and uh, the latter part of it about Chhattisgarh Bastar was very, very moving. I mean, I don't 
I can't remember having felt moved in an academic kind of setting for a very long time. So thank you, Nandini, for yeah. the book and all the work that you do. So, yeah. So um, what I wanted to ask you, Dolly, was that, um, you know, when, um, you know, we've seen the triple talaq debate and, the, you know, the debates around that. So, you know, when you talk about 33% reservation or when you think about that, I mean, I remember that, uh, you know, what, how, what do you think of the tendency to completely, of, even of outside commentators, mm -hmm. to erase the, uh, you know, when you talk about Naga opinion, then to just erase the opinion of Naga women or the fact that there is a Naga women's movement mm -hmm. that is demanding something. Mm -hmm. um, the instance in my mind was mm -hmm. around the time that that debate was happening, a rather kind of instrumental kind of piece that came out in the scroll where a journalist uh, wrote about the Naga, um, you know, agitation against 33% reservation, um, to say that that means, on the basis of that, that uniform civil code is not a real possibility in India ever. Now, I would agree about uniform civil code, fine. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that, you know, he, uh, he, meant, he said, he wrote about it as though the 33% reservation is a state-imposed law, and that Naga opinion, he, he just talked about <laughs> Naga opinion being against the law. So when I asked him on Twitter, I mm. said, he's a journalist I respect otherwise. I said that, you know, um, Naga opinion, after all, there's Naga women's opinion. So why not at least, how come there's no mention of the fact that there are Naga women's movements agitating for this? So it's not just the state, you know, it's not just the state and a state-imposed law and Naga opinion here. Mm. He just wouldn't see it at all, you know. It was just a re complete refusal. He said, I'm not writing a thesis. I said, yeah, but you're writing a journalistic piece. So how do you see that? Do, does that happen a lot? Or does that happen inside, you know, in, 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 you know, in Nagaland, inside, um, you know, the movement also? Sh shall, I, shall I take or shall we take a couple? Does anyone else have a question? Yeah, um, th thank you for the for the question. And it reminds me, I was I was in Queensland. I was around the Great Barrier Reef two weeks ago, looking at the Adani mining and trying to take over indigenous land, Central Australia, for coal mining. And there's a huge resistance. And I was sitting with indigenous elders, and one of the stories that came up, because what you say, Kavita, is really not limited to Nagas. It's a universal story um, of of really. The, the violence and the contestations, the most contested debates really within, within each community. An indigenous elder told us this story that um, when, when the trees, it, it goes something like this, when the, when the, when, when, when the ax came to the forest, right? The, the, when the woodcutter came to the forest with an ax, the trees said that the handle is one of us. Mm -hmm. And I think that in itself is very profound and it really captures the, the, the struggles that go within, in terms of who's trying to cut whose voice. And, you know, the N N Naga community is so small, right? It's not even two millions in terms of what's happening. But I would say, I would say this very, very clearly that the, the, the Naga right to self-determination and the struggles that's, that's gone on since India's independence is one of the key important sites really to talk about justice, to talk about sovereignty, and to talk about human rights violations in contemporary India. So in terms of literature, in terms of political conversations, the Naga people have been very central in, in terms of framing India's uh, human rights politics right there, and gender being one of them. And I think you clearly point that out. And, and like any struggles, that is missing. Yeah, and like any struggles that's missing, some see it and some don't, but, and that's when we say taking a position is important, right? It's not about convincing, it's about coming and becoming the political being. And I think you're quite right about that. So thank you for your question. But can I just also respond yeah. to that? It's, I mean, there've been so many debates, both with the Kasi Women's uh, Custom of Lineage Act, the Jharkhand things, where it's not clear that women would necessarily get more justice from a formal legal system. So mm -hmm. this whole question is so problematic with respect to both the UCC and with respect to the patriarchies within that I don't know how one would sort of start addressing it in a way that, I mean, one needs to start addressing it in a way. And just mm -hmm. the fact that whatever it is, I mean, the women there are trying to come to grips with it. They may change their mind. They may assess things differently from others. They just do not, you know, pretend it's not there. Right, so now I guess it's Sheila, Pamela, Shandipta. Okay, 
So lots of questions, so I'll be uh, quick and brief. Thank you so much, I really enjoyed that. My question is also to Dolly. I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about the relationship between political violence and sexual violence, and also, well, and by sexual violence, I mean really at the scale of the intimate and the everyday, and also how that work has been received. I mean, you suggested that it's actually spurning a lot of interest, but have you, I mean, I presume it's also been very difficult for a community to receive that kind of work. I mean, it's also something I explored when I looked at the Noxialite movement, and I was looking at it 30 years later, and it was really difficult for you know women to uh, talk about their comrades as being sexual aggressors. Mm -hmm. So I just, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we were talking at the coffee break about sovereignty, yeah. and you were saying that it was a very important issue for feminists and for women. And I was wondering if you would elaborate on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. This might be too broad a question, so please feel free to say it is, if that's the case. But this, this seems to be a few times both of you uh, suggested that uh, somehow the th study of Indian politics in general, political theory, or Indian political th uh, theory in general, uh, the fact that it completely ignores these zones of exception or the margins, or you can call it in almost uh, colonial zones, um, be that Buxar, be that Nagaland, be that Kashmir, and so on. Uh, <laughs> makes it problematic the way are, are Indian. Are you saying these are zones of exception, or you're saying that it's within, it exists, it, it exists within That's the Russia. question, yeah. So, so I was wondering in the sense that, like, so there's two ways in which people have done with, with like colonialism uh, a lot. One is uh. that to say that we can study this as zones of exceptions outside the norm which the constitute the center, or to say that actually the, the center or the norm is constituted by these experiences which happen there. In other words, making them even more central for anybody who wants to say anything meaningful about Indian politics, Indian political history, or political theory, okay. to look there, you know, not just as something which happens, you know, where the norm gets cut, cut off or something in the margin, but something which actually constitutes what happens uh, within. So I was just wondering whether you guys um, had some thought on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nandini, you, you go ahead with this. Um, well, I'll just go with Sandeep's yeah. question. The yeah. other stuff is yeah. Srila's history. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I think both. I mean, in a sense, clearly, uh, as the state overall is getting more militarized, um, then what some people think of as zones of exception are really enfolded into the normal everyday. And in fact, the fact that, you know, AK Gopala and all those PD uh, provisions, all of that. Um, have always been there uh, and through the Constitutional Assembly means that these were never disconnected in the first place. Um, so I think um, there's that, that uh, one needs to think of the Indian state in a different way, Indian history in a different way, but also just think of, um, I mean, because the history of the Northeast is done so much through counterinsurgency and you know it's now that Dolly and others are beginning to work on completely new things like food or uh, love or et cetera, that we don't, I mean, if, I'm, if I put together a textbook on food in, you know, uh, um, for instance, there's this book that I just read on food in Indian history, which doesn't have anything on the Northeast. So all of that also needs to happen because there's all sorts of other stuff, other kinds of histories, other cross-border movements, which just are not studied. So I think, that's, I mean, both. And you know that as well. <laughs> so, so, so the, thank you, yeah. So, so this trick, I have three questions and they're all interrelated. One has to do with violence, sexual violence, and with whether there's a distinction. Um, I think it all comes with an, sexual violence is political violence. If the body is seen, you know, as a political side. Uh, and so th there's no two way about it. And that's why we really, what we want at the end is really a form of justice. And, and I think it's, it's a process. And you, you very rightly put it that it's not easy for people to talk about it. And, and we start talking about it as a collective by uh, working towards trust. And that is really a political trust. And women who share with us, and men as well, and boys who share with us stories of, of sexual violence, they do it from a place once they begin trusting us with their stories and how we tell it. And so if, if I'm telling that monograph story here in Oslo, I feel that this, 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 is, this is a safe space in a way to understand of, uh, a shared sense of politics. And that's very important and key to it. And that relates to the uh, question about sovereignty. 
sovereignty is so central to understanding it. And I think when we look at societies in the Northeast who have dealt with armed struggle and social movements for a, for a long time, the issue of sovereignty has been key and central to it. And here, I think we need to re-examine what we mean by sovereignty or the sovereign. These are multiple sovereigns. We pay tax to many groups, right? And so in the foothills where I worked as a PhD, people talk about uh, people talk about sovereign powers in terms of naming it, like Nagaland, Assam, India. And it's very clear, multiple sovereigns and how they deal with it. So multiple negotiations, multiple performances. And so very key to it. But what I'm more interested in my work is actually to, to forge and to think about a feminist version of thinking about sovereignty. Because for, for many, many years, looking at the, the political project, whether it's of right to self-determination or of sovereignty, these are quite masculine projects because as, as soon as we talk about politics, we talk about, we talk about armed struggles, we talk about a form of militarism where maybe in terms of talk, women sitting together and talking about politics is really uh, you know, uh, not visible. And this is something that in, hopefully in my future project, I want to bring it up really looking at even the concept of right to self-determination from a feminist perspective and a framework, and how is it that we can claim a sense of the collective and justice? It's very central. Um, the last question about zones of exception. I think you, you give me right, like two, two options. One is, like, is, is it a central site? So this marginal site, is it a central site to think about politics, or are these zones of exception? Um, it depends on who you are, right? So if you are part of Oil India or ONGC, uh, or if you are, yeah, you know, Indian security forces within barricades. The zone of exception, actually, the zone of exception is not your army barrack. The zone of exception is there, the ethnic village, which is going to come and attack you. So you have safe space, it's really the barricade. And, and for the village then, you know, experiencing country insurgency, the zone of exception is really you know, out, out there in terms of what the security forces, what the camps are doing in their village and in their site. Um, but thinking about zone of exceptions and, and really are these centers of power, sites of power, how do we think about it? Capital is a good way to approach this because, because talking about capital commodity and how Assam tea and Assam oil, or timber for that matter, migration, labor has flown out of the region for so many years, it shows us that this entire soft categories about zone of exception or marginal spaces just breaks apart. Right? Since the 19th century, the railways, everywhere, the whole world brings us empty, and yet we talk, talk about zones of exception. Right? Not quite. The, the, the contradiction would be how is it that these have become such sites of global commodity, global capital, and yet poverty, armed conflict, and desperate disposition, inequalities still remain. I think that in itself would be the contradiction right there. Yeah, yeah I mean, Assam has been so integral to the Indian story just in terms of migration from the 30s from yeah. Tarkand and so on as yeah. well so you can't yeah. really think of it without um, okay thank you both for really a beautiful conversation and extremely extremely moving um, I guess and, and I was thinking I guess as both of you were talking um, about Fanon and Wretched of the Earth, where you know there is the manifesto, and then there is uh, the psychoanalytic <laughs> part of that text, and people don't, in a sense, see those two things together. And I'm very reminded of it because it seems to me that the conversation that you've had is somehow bringing those two things together in, in some strange way, at least in my mind. But the question that I had was. Um, in some ways maybe goes back to Srila's, which is um, this question of um, kind of violence and, and its kind of mimicry and its brutalization and where we think of men and vulnerability in this kind of picture you've drawn for us, Dolly. So, um, you know, the question of impunity, the question of sexual violence is, is one. But there's also a kind of brutalization if you think about this, you know, 20th century history indeed of war and warfare and militarization is actually also the making of men. Mm -hmm. So how would you see that kind of reflection of kind of violence, counter-violence as it were? Where would you place that within your analytics in thinking about the question of uh, sexual violence in terms of women, which you were talking about? Um, and I just wondered about this. Um, but, but clearly, it's, it's also this broader question of you know, violence, counter-violence, mm. counter-insurgency, and then peace. 
Um, and it's setting up a very interesting kind of a dialectic Nandini as well with, uh, you know, what you said, I was struck by this idea that there hasn't been a peace movement, there's always been a kind of oppositional um, space within a kind of democratic consensus for pushing against these forms of dispossession. Um, so it's just kind of playing with the kinds of categories that both of you been, have been using and if you could just think a little bit more about this. Um, in terms of also the way we've been thinking about agonistic democracies and so on and so forth. Um, just a kind of open question, if you want to take it up. Do you want to go ahead? You, you, um, can, you can go ahead. And then I'll go. No, actually, I just want to say that if one wanted to do a different a history of militarization and men um, in the Indian subcontinent, um, I would actually locate it in World War II and actually World War I and World War II, which are hugely understudied in terms of their effects on political movements. So the Naga movement, the Mizo movement, actually not just the ideology, but the weaponry, the, mm -hmm. the use of the Morse code in the Mizo movement, uh, mm -hmm. you know, MNF signaling across hills, all of that. Um, and the way the Naga and Mizo, and perhaps, I mean, you can also talk about this, is the way they're organized are very much modeled on the Indian army compared to the Maoists who are organizationally, militarily different. Um, but the, and that relates also to the role of demobilized soldiers during partition violence. So the role of the army in enabling violence in mass opposition movements, as well as communal movements, as well as a variety of other trainings that all kinds of armed movements have had is something I think um, really needs to be looked at. So just in terms of the militarization of men and a really good question, thank you. Um, so thinking about violence, brutalization, and men, right? I think it's given, it's, it, it's given rise to two things. And before I speak about two things, I'll, I'll talk about really this, this masculine, masculine tribal men that's come up, right? So um, in terms of the anxieties, in terms of really the forcefulness of what they want to do, it's led to many more violence and uh, Two things. One is really the live experiences of men, and how they how they see, see themselves. There's no space for them to be vulnerable because as soon as they become an adult, they have to become member in a traditional council. They have to claim land. They have to claim that they are not losers, and you know they are they are they are able to take care take charge of houses. Majority of migrants are women. Majority of migrant women from the Northeast are actually tribal women who are working as masseurs, as, as, as receptionists, as front desk. And they're sending back money to their brothers, to their fathers who want to do some kind of business. So there's a huge kind of a violent aspect right there in terms of structural violence, right? Where they don't become heads of families, take money from women all the time. So really this leads to a lot of insecurities and anxieties. If you look around India, you know, talking about 23 million population just there in a small place called Northeast India, a lot of them have something called student union. If you scratch the surface of any metropolitan city across India, they have something called student union. And these are all headed by boys as young as 18 and 19. And they're moral police, what women do. Right? They, had, they, set up punch, they set up courts, kangaroo courts in the middle of cities, and they said, oh, you're sleeping around with that, you're sleeping, they have so much time at hand. So it's really spawned a different kind of a really masculine, chauvinistic, uh, you know, politics that starts very young, which is so disturbing, and you catch on that, right, kind of the militarized aspect of it, which is so important. The second thing, actually, is the institutionalization, the modeling that goes on. So any kind of NGO who comes, UNICEF, or Grameen Bank, UNDP, anyone who comes, they straight go to women and they say, oh, you, you, you are the model, right? Yeah. Victim to survivor. We won't use women as victims, we'll use women as survivors. So you start um, self-help groups. We'll give you microcredit. So really there's a doubling of responsibility for them that they have to prove so hard that, they're, that they are women, that they are survivors. And really that leaves out a lot of men as, as losers, and I think there are some very good feminist literature on that, on this development model that's really aggravated this kind of uh, gender injustice in many armed um, conflict situations. And I think you hit that idea quite well at the core of it. Thanks, yeah. Okay, thanks both. I have a question that goes back to the start of today's uh, program, really. And I'm sort of thinking that the violence that especially Sunil discussed as being constitutive of the making of the Republic, if you will, seems to still be so defining of the workings of the state in both the areas where you worked and that you've talked about. So my question then becomes, 
does the democracy that we're discussing here over these two days, even down to its you know, even most minimal provisions in terms of, let's say, civil liberties, have anything to offer for a potential politics of hope for the future in your respective areas? Okay, um, well, that's what I was saying. In a sense, we are hostages to democracy because it's, it's an aporia that you kind of, you know, or it's a predicament where w not this, but what else, kind of. Uh, so clearly, yes, a more ideal democracy where money didn't matter, where people actually, you know, parties were reflecting particular ideological positions instead of just... Um, so all of that, uh, but... Um, yeah, I mean, like, where in the world can one not think about how to improve democracy, right? So it's not just an Indian project, it's a worldwide project. And what other projects should we be engaged in, do you think? I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, India at 70, so in, in regard to this conversation we're having right now in Oslo, you mean, or the, or the larger? No, 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 no. In a space, uh -huh. in a sense, where democracy is in many ways so absent, where the workings of the state are so coercive, so violent, where you in a sense see the limits of democratic, you know, the limits of democratic legality even <laughs> drawn so clearly. Does it make any sense to draw resources, you know, of various kinds from that democracy in order to try and craft an alternative future? It does. There's no question about it. If you look at all the people struggle in the subcontinent, I think, that, and I would say that. The, 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 the Naga movement is one of the oldest, and the fact that I'm a product of that. I was born in the middle of the conflict, and I remain so hopeful, and I, bec and, and I remain so joyful, because in the darkest of times in, in, around South Asia, we have been able to talk about a politics of hope and a politics of solidarity, and I think that's so important to keep it alive. As much as times are dark, um, you know, we work around ideals of justice, and and the, the, the Naga ceasefire started in 1997, Alf. It's, it's 20 years, and it's a long, long, long time when people have given up. A lot of seniors have given up hope. A lot of them have become alcoholics. Many have died. Many have disappeared. Uh, you know, many have just retired and said, OK, that's it. We can't do this anymore. And yet, at this time, what do we tell? You know, what, what do we tell young people? What do we tell old people? I think it's not only in terms of looking at the subcontinent all over globally, I have students who, who are extremely, at, at 19, they've given up hope. At 20, they're cynics, right? And as, as teachers, we encounter such students. And I think in what ways then, the, the, the politics that we believe in, that our political projects can resonate both inside the classroom and outside the classroom, I think these are really important questions that, that I often think, think with. When people say that, you know, oh, not like the Vietnam War, when my parents were part of, maybe not that 3,000 rally, 3,000 people rally in Assam that took place, maybe 20 of us gathering, that's good enough to start a political conversation. Um, and I think it's important, it's important to really talk about a politics of hope that, in, that, that with the assassination murder of Gauri Lankesh, we have a voice to talk about her, even in Kohima or in Mokokchong, that when something happens in Jinnaboto, people from Chhattisgarh have the right to say that this is, this is wrong. And that small voice, what is, what is called small, you know, that it still rings, is extremely important. Students from Assam, when they finish the MA, they want to go to Kashmir. And I see this as a politics of hope. People from Kerala come to Nagaland. People from Chennai, they come for political tours. To, to Assam, and I think it's where we look at that we find the joy of a politics of solidarity and hope. And I think we need to keep talking about it. We, and we, we shouldn't let anyone tell us that it's not possible. And, and so, so when I, when I read um, Nandini Sundar's, I think, a dedication that this book was for everyone who hate the arrogance of the, <laughs> what, what did you write? This book is for everyone who hate the arrogance and the violence of the Indian state, I, I smiled. And then I, and I focus on the word hate, and I said, 
I will not give the Indian state that luxury because hate requires a lot of energy, right? <laughs> it, it's a very powerful passion and it requires a lot of energy to give that to the Indian state. No, in fact, I'll be joyful in the politics that I do. And I think joy is a better way for me, but I, I know where you're coming from, so I respect that. So yeah, I'm very hopeful. But I had other things too, not just hate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Read the whole thing, Dolly, don't. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have a small question to this very interesting conversation. Uh, in a way, you're talking about the uh, obvious paradox. In a way, you're talking about uh, silent alternative voices, which are not very um, uh, visible in the public. But on the other side, the discourses you're talking about, the sexualized discourses about the impurity and other related uh, themes like, for example, rape, and things like that, taps into the most central political public discourses these days, which fuels the um, discourses, paranoid and frightened discourses about the other, whether they are Muslim, whether they are, for example, Bengali migrant workers in Kerala, or whether they are yeah, Muslims in Norway or Germany, just to talk about the Frankfurter case. Uh, yeah. I just want you to say something about that obvious paradox. It's like silent, but very public at the same time. Maybe it's the very way it's talked about that marks the difference. Because according to me, uh, a lot of the public discourses these days are actually very, very sexualized. Mm, I didn't quite get, so, yes. So. Uh, I think, uh, can I answer? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, sure. Um, yeah. So I think um, your, I mean, that's a really great observation that it's something that is constantly there in the public discourse, but certain kinds of rapes are sexual violence is silenced. And I think it, okay. it depends on who takes up what and for what objective uh, as well. So certain kinds of people are non-people and therefore their rapes don't matter and certain rapes are politically inconvenient, as in the mm -hmm. underground, I mean, or the Kader rapes, etc. And certain other kinds of rapes are politically convenient because it's a beating stick to beat a whole community with. So I think uh, the politics of rape um, is something that is hard to uh, talk about explicitly without sounding as if you're saying what about, you know, doing what about re. But so I think we need to find a way of sort of saying that rape matters, mm. but also certain ways of talking about rape are problematic. And we need to sort of balance, keep that in mind. I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's Subir, yeah. Um Thanks to both of you for uh, you know s speaking about such a lot of things so well, and for identifying things which are bleak and things about which to be bleak, and things which are hopeful mm -hmm. and things about which to be hopeful. Um, I really wanted to just come back to your peace movement point. I mean, if you think about that from uh, one perspective, where there are peace movements are places where either they have gotten done with primitive accumulation and wars of sovereignty, or they have pushed them into a zone of invisibility. In the case of India, and in the cases of many other places like India, primitive accumulation and the wars of sovereignty are ongoing and very immediate. In that kind of a setting, can you really have a peace movement? Or can you just hope for the best, which is to reduce brutality in everyday life? <coughs> Um, I guess this is sort of a similar, well, maybe not. Um, I just, <laughs> I am really struck by this notion of being hostage to democracy. Um, and it seemed like any time either of you was talking about um, alternative political imaginaries, you know, other sort of possible projects, um, you didn't really use the word democracy, right? Um, I mean, Dolly, you use hope. 
you talked about peace, and I just, and I think that, you know, um, we keep trying to conscript all of these other languages um, into the sort of rhetoric of democracy. So it all becomes about the improving of democracy, right? Um, so I wonder if you could say something about what that impulse to conscript, right, other political languages, other political imaginaries mm -hmm. into the framework of democracy, how does that, how does that cripple us politically, right? Um, and if it isn't about, I mean, you know, Nandini, you said, how can you not be for democracy, right? So there really is a sort of failure of, I, know, I don't know whether it's just language uh, or imagination, um, but what does that sort of act of conscription do, right? Um, and, and how do we get out of that? Um, um, one of the things that's happening in the US right now, which I've been following somewhat closely, is um, this sort of battle between um, you know, proponents of progressive democracy of whatever sort and um, the anarchists, right? Um, and you, you can really see in that standoff, you know, this sort of inability you know, on the part of, you know, sort of progressive activists and, and academics uh, to interrogate democracy more fully, right? Um, whether it's interrogating the state or whatever it is, like there's just an, a, a sort of an unwillingness uh, to engage fully with anarchism, for instance, right? Um, so can you say something about what you see as, as particularly problematic about trying to reroute everything back, right, um, through democracy as the sort of ultimate political project? Thank you both for everything you do. Um, this has been wonderful. Um, but I, you know, it, to link the, this question to the question of sovereignty, uh, Dali, you mentioned something very sort of provocative at some point about a sort of feminist sort of solution or answer or, or sort of uh, approach to the question of sovereignty. And this question of democracy and sovereignty are usually linked. One it becomes the precondition for the other. And you've used the term right of self uh, self determination multiple times. So I. I I, I, I'm sort of just, you know, where does sovereignty fit into this question, and do they need a sort of post? Do we need a sort of post-sovereignty politics in some way, or a sort of a way of imagining democracy without sovereignty? Um, uh, uh, um, and I'm here thinking, you know, along the lines of uh, uh, Abdullah Öcalan and the sort of the, the Kurdish movement that we're seeing now, and the way in which they're sort of, uh, uh, sort of radically reconfiguring these notions. But that's basically. My Thank you for, uh, I mean, a really wonderful session. And my question ties back to this issue of democracy. And uh, it's really more, I mean, I think it's something that I'm trying to figure out uh, myself, and it's, it worries me a lot, and I don't, perhaps I'll not formulate a good question, but see, this, this issue of multiple sovereignties, you know, which you raised, and the thing which is there, is, seems to me so crucial to the kind of questions that you're raising, because, uh, in some ways, it seems to me that one way of thinking of the distinctiveness of our moment, and when I say moment, I don't mean just the present, I mean maybe more than 100 years, you know, uh, is the over, is a sense in which a subject-object way of, of creating relationships mm -hmm. is uh, coming more and more to displace a self, other, intimate order. And in a sense, what's interesting about the self, other, intimate uh, order is that it's, it enables multiple sovereignties. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, I wonder whether when we think of minority politics, uh, to the extent that no minority politics can ever completely give up on sovereignty. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I mean, so it's not really, I suppose more than, it's not really a question, it's, I suppose it's, my question is really, where would you take multiple sovereignties? Where, what kind of conversations do you think are even possible in terms of, let us say, for example, clearly the Indian state uh, create not doesn't just other, uh, you know, the Northeast mm -hmm. doesn't. It, it also, in some senses, makes the Northeast an object. Yeah, and there are these are two different phenomena, overlapping phenomena, 
but two different phenomena. And in some ways, a lot of politics that is not seeking to return to an annihilatory politics would have to, in some way or the other, engage with, or shall we say, disaggregate the Indian state. Or if not the Indian state, the, you know, disaggregating the Indian state would first of all mean not treating it as a state in the same way. Right? So I suppose that's the place where I'm asking, what would a multiple, what would the politics of multiple sovereignty involve? You know, if you're thinking of alternatives, if you're thinking of hope, is that something that, you know, is at all opens issues up? I already have four questions. Okay. So add, Sorry. Yeah. Do you want to go? <laughs> so, um, so first about sexual violence and what kinds of sexual violence become visible and what doesn't become visible. I think a good example would be the the 2006 uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was set up in Nepal after 10 years of insurgency. Because at the core of it was to recognize rape as a crime against humanity. But there is what, there was a statute, uh, uh, there was a procedural uh, defect to that because it said any, any uh, cases of rape should be uh, reported uh, 35 days within, within that violent action. And also within the Truth and Reconciliation uh, set up in Nepal, they say that the, the focus would be on, on, on forgiveness, on reconciliation. And so, so I think it's really looking at mechanisms, looking at mechanisms, institutions that we're looking at, at this kind of sexual uh, violence. Uh, and, and how is it that we can really bring sexual violence into the realm of justice? And you know, talk about it long term it becomes really, really important. People are still talking about, uh, let's say, the 1971 uh, 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 Bangladesh War and the and the sexual violence that was committed, and the Kangaroo Court, court that came up in 2009. So these are really historical injustices that go on, and this is a process. We can't say that it'll stop, but these are processes that we have to keep it open for people to talk about historical injustices, sexual violence being really an important part of of the political project. Um, um, the, the second one has to do with peace, mo peace movements and how do we talk about people's movement in the in the in the middle of violence? Uh, someone asked about peace movement. Who was that? Sudhir. Sudhir. Yeah. How do how we how do we talk about peace movements? Well, um, peace is very central to to uh, to, to movements uh, or or to to. Uh, the count to the history of counterinsurgency. So we can't just relegate the 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 work of peace to you know people's movements and, and to people who are on the ground. It's really, I think, since 1993 when the government of India set up the human rights commissions all over the state, and the and the Indian Army uh, took over the the language of human rights to say that we will teach you human rights and made human rights and peace in itself a counterinsurgency tool and instrument. We see a huge division right there. Today, it's really not the people, but it's the Assam police and the Assam rifles who call themselves the friends of the hill people. I think that, is, that in itself is very powerful to see where peace is going. Um, I think for those of us who have been in the civil and political rights movement, there's no two ways about it. We, you know, I, think, I, I think we are not naive to understand that peace is really you know, a lala word that's there. It's very, very rife. When we talk about peace among uh, communities who have experienced ethnic cleansing, these are really like new generations of kids who are not willing to forgive, whether it's the Naga Kuki, whether it's the Santali, Boro, and it's extremely difficult. So we have to, I feel, start from the place where peace is the most difficult thing. It's almost kind of an impossible utopia that we have to achieve in some way, right? But then by working towards it, the process in itself is a political process of understanding. And the only thing that we ha have is really this, this shared humanity of a political understanding towards justice. And I feel that that's really, really important. It's really humbling, I would say, to really be part of collectives to look at how people are trying to find peace and how they break down. You know, students in Assam, where I teach, and I'm a visiting faculty, not being able to go home to Manipur for three, four months because there's a blockade, and they're trying to read, uh, and trying to find peace to forgive their roommate who is from a different ethnic community who's b burning their village. I think that is really when we look at peace, raw peace in itself, and try to understand that. Yeah. Um, the, the third one has to do with other political languages and imaginations. I think, Ajanta, that's... 
that's something that I often think about. And English is not my first language. And I say that very, I, I speak Lothai, I speak Assamese, I speak Nagamese, I speak many other languages. And one of the challenges that I've had in understanding theory in English was really to look up meanings. Uh, democracy, I don't even know whether there's an English word, maybe it's from Greek, whether it's coming from somewhere and how we have, we have taken, taken it for granted that it's an English word and we need to be attached to it. Maybe in, in 100 years, we'll find a better term. Maybe we'll find a word called oko. Oko in, in my language means the collective. Maybe it will be a collective vision. Maybe it will be some kind of socialism, not to shy away from those terms. Uh, um, so it becomes really important. One of the things that I do as a teacher, as a non-native you know, native English speaker, is that whenever I start a class and I'm teaching some really, really difficult concepts, which I myself grapple with at times, and I have an international student group they come from Cambodia, they come from Vietnam, they come from Bangladesh, and, the, and I see that the way they struggle, because I struggled like that in grad school as well, you know, with a lot of pretentious students who thought that English was really, right, their, uh, their, their language since time immemorial. Um, we do an exercise. We write the English word for democracy, let's say, for example, and we write and we try to translate that in all the languages we speak, and what kind of vision and what kind of opening does it give us? And I think that in itself for me has been a very powerful tool to work towards a concrete future in terms of the abstractions um, and the confusions that we have. So, so democracy, if we look at it as a point, I think for many, for many good intention, well-intentioned Indian in intellectuals, it has been a way to keep the country together. But for, for a lot of well-intentioned revolutionaries, for the longest time, it's also been a process to see that India realizes that a lot of regions that it's held on, that it's occupied, should be made free. And so it's how we translate that and how we look into that. And I think the struggles will still remain. Um, the, the, the fourth thing has to do with multiple sovereignties that Ajay Skaria raised, and what do we, what do, we do? Uh, you know, is, is where, where does it take us? It's, it, you, you, you speak about where does it take us as though it's in the future. People are dealing with it already, right? So if you look at Kashmir, if you look at Chhattisgarh, if you look at a large part of Northeast, you look at Jaffna, you look at the Swat Bed in uh, Pakistan, a lot of people much, much early on that we even realized that it existed. People have dealt with the Indian Army, they have dealt with the Burmese Army, they have dealt with their state armies, they have dealt with four or five occupying forces at the same time. So the, so this sense of engaging with multiple sovereignties is not there in the future, it's already here in the present, and people have been doing it for the longest time. So how do we understand, and is there a name, like coming back to Ajanta, is there a name that we can give it, really kind of, you know, a lived experience in itself? Um, and what do we do with the politics of naming, right? And naming are for the future in terms of this uh, politics that we are seeking to achieve. So, so yeah, so I guess these are some of my thoughts that I have. Thank you. Um, just picking up from some of the things that Dolly said. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, so multiple sovereignties is not either something in the future, practice now, very old. I mean, in a sense, um, if your question, your question though was not really about the formal multiple sovereignties that we live in, but the internal um, giving over of consent to somebody else versus, I mean, who one is with respect to the other, right? And I think that is the central problem with democracy, that the idea that um, it's when the people themselves are being formed by the process of democracy, when there is nobody who's giving consent because that consent giving subject is itself the object of formation, uh, is what is the most problematic uh, impasse that one is constantly coming up against, right? And if you look at how democracy is defined, if, I mean, all the standard things, electoralism clearly is not democracy. The provisioning of welfare benefits because people are being remodeled to receive those welfare benefits in terms of being a population that must be administered. So whatever it is that you think about as part of the traditional basket of democracy actually has so many anti-democratic implications. But I think partly, I mean, what Dolly was saying that it's in the everyday practice that whether we call it democracy or not, that negotiation, um, that sense of there being something to, um, 
needing to negotiate through a just path rather than having something imposed uh, is something that, you know, whether it's in a Soviet commune or any kind of system that has ever been known to human beings, people have felt the need to do that. So what alternative has there been? I mean, in the anarchist movement, you know, so in a sense, it's not about democracy as it is currently defined, but or even how you negotiate your relationship with the other, the fact that you are negotiating that and is something that I think is part of that process. And just in terms of Subir, um, I don't agree that it's always been where primitive accumulation has ended because sometimes it's, I mean, if you look at the Mizo case, for instance, which is one of the only, apart from the Naga peace movement, which is still not, I mean, the accord is not concluded, I mean, it's completely, but the Mizo movement did have a peace accord. And in a way there was, the accumulation begins now. It was, it was never an issue with, um, during all those years of the MNF fighting and uh, the government, uh, you know, evacuating people, etc. So, I think uh, we just don't. Uh, it's not. I mean, a lot of people in the sort of the Maoist context would argue, you know, if you had peace, it would just be a piece of the graveyard, or people would be able to come in and, um, you know, take over resources, etc. But it's not as if the Maoists are the only movement fighting against natural resource takeovers. So it's not as if you, if you had peace with the Maoists that everybody else would just sit quiet and say, okay, come, come, take my land, right? So it's just the beginning. It's not necessarily the end of the struggle against resource takeover. Uh, and that is just the beginning and not the end of our conference. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for it. Okay, Thanks everyone, it's been, it's been a good day. And we have another good one coming tomorrow. And just